Okay. Uh, let's get started. No, don't worry. Let's get started. Uh, before we begin with the round table, uh, I have two short announcements. Uh, we've organized a book of condolences for Thierry. It's placed just in front of me across the hall. You will not miss it. So if you'd like to uh, write, um, you know, whatever you have uh, in your memory uh, regarding Thierry, uh, please do so. Uh, do so there. Uh, uh, the book will be given to Thierry's partner, Susie Olsen. Uh, and uh, after this round table, uh, we would also like to organize a small tribute, roughly in the same way like we did for Adam Kilgariff back in 2015, uh, by you know sharing uh, whatever fond memories of Thierry we have. So whoever wants, please stay in after the uh, after the round table, and we will continue. And handing over. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, before I <coughs> give the microphone to Simon, I would just like to say that. Um, uh, well, I have to take you back to when we were organizing, uh, we started planning the conference and I remember we got the abstracts, the abstracts were accepted and then we told Milos, you need to start preparing the program, right? Uh, and Milos slowly took his time, yes, it took a while, but then I remember um, Yelena and I had discussions, you know, uh, wait a minute, uh, you know, there is, w what was it called, the elephant in the room, okay? We needed to talk about the elephant and it would be um, a big mistake to have an ELEX conference without uh, some discussion on chat GPT because then there's two years and in two years maybe we won't even be talking about chat GPT anymore. So we said we need to organize this round table. So imagine Milos preparing the program and we and he was saying, oh, it's packed, How? where do I put everything? And then we say, you need to find another hour for a round table. So Mila shocked, you know, I need to cram this into the program, but we felt, you know, people will appreciate it and it's very important. Now, we have an impressive panel here, uh, Yerna and I, <laughs> we, s we said we need to, you know, get all the, the people that uh, can say something um, new and something informative about chat GPT. Uh, and I thank Simon to quickly say, uh, I'm willing to moderate this. I'm willing to take on the panelists and challenge them. So we would like to thank you, uh, to thank everybody for coming and to you all. And uh, we look forward to a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Tuck. So the important uh, part of this round table is actually the content, the discussion about ChatGPT. So if you don't know who, who the people sitting behind the table are, just check on the website. We will not do the introduction. We will go directly into the matter itself. And what, uh, so how this discussion will be organized is in the following way. Uh, first, uh, I asked already mm, all the five panelists to prepare like a statement what they think is the most important message to you, the people who are sitting here. It should not take more than three minutes each and I will be quite strict about this. And then we have the discussion, uh, <coughs> well, based basically on what will be said uh, in the first round. And uh, <coughs> I would like to start with my nearest neighbor, Gilles Maurice. Right, and then that way we will start at one end of the spectrum. So in a Tokyo talk last February, I summarized my position on the use of chat GPT in lexicography with the end of lexicography, welcome to the machine. And it may surprise you after uh, some of the previous talks, I still stand by this claim. So, in reply to Michael Rundle's rebuttal last week at the Asia Lex conference in Seoul, in which he concluded his paper with chat GPT does not herald the end of lexicography. I can now add that. One, I believe that chat GPT makes dictionaries redundant. Two, 
I believe that ChatGPT makes lexicographers redundant. And three, I believe that ChatGPT, if you really insist, makes the current post-editing lexicographic tools redundant. And I say this, and I believe this, not because it is true. I say this because the mere existence of ChatGPT gives us the illusion that it is possible. One, if dictionaries were not already redundant in the era of mere search engines, they certainly are in today's age of AI chatbots. Think Bing Chat. Two, as it stands, the dictionary writing system Swanelex now has an open AI section where users may enter their open AI secret key for any of the open AI functionality to work using either built-in default prompts or their own custom prompts, entire dictionaries may now be compiled literally overnight and in beautifully structured XML without any further intervention, making lexicographers us redundant. Three, such a single prompt instruction is certainly an improvement over the current semi-automated tasks of corpus building, corpus annotation, headword selection, or rather, first headword list creation, word sense divisions, think word sketches, the pinpointing of salient collocations, the creation of definitions, translations, the selection of corpus derived examples, think codex, the addition of related words, etc., etc., all of which need human intervention. This brings us to the quality of such a fully automated product. Well, in an age of invisible lexicography where users treat their smartphones as black boxes, that can do everything and anything, the quality may not matter anymore. If users performed an AI-enhanced search, all they wanted was an answer, and they got that. Further, if publishers, some may perhaps want to call them rogue publishers, want to release a dictionary without any human intervention, given it is possible today, they will do it it will happen, and it has already happened. Therefore, concluding sentence, if we still want to meet in two years from now, dare I say, at the hypothetical ELEX conference, we will need to start taking ChatGPT more seriously and treat it as a fully-fledged lexicographer, prompter, if you want. If we still want to try convincing the general public that humans are actually better than large language models, we will have to backtrack and insist that we went back to the art and craft of compiling dictionaries, doing much more manually than is actually the case. Your mice. Um, uh, well, I'm very much the non-technical person on this panel, uh, so I'm coming at this from my background in dictionary publishing as a dictionary editor. And um, for a long time, at least 20 years, I've been interested in automating various parts of the dictionary making process, all the way from language data collection uh, right up to publishing the finished dictionary and everything in between. And the goal of that is not to put lexicographers out of a job, but First of all, to relieve them of intellectually undemanding, routine, boring tasks. Uh, and secondly, by reducing costs, costs to the publisher, um, to make it possible to do more projects, projects which might not be viable uh, otherwise using traditional methods, which of course are very uh, labor intensive and expensive. My default position on automation is that pretty much everything is likely to be doable in the end. Um, most aspects of what we do should be automatable. Um, I, I think I learned that from Adam Kilgariff, really, that if you apply enough imagination and enough intellectual curiosity. So against that background, uh, you know, can large language models do the job? Well, currently, no. I mean, I think you know, we've seen lots of uh, demos to show that that's the case. But I think there's much there that's very impressive. And, you know, it's very early days, isn't it? I believe that most of the problems that we've encountered are likely to be fixable. Um, but anyway, Simone asked us to make one main point. So this is my one. Um, I 
always remember that one of the very first word sketches I looked at, and this is kind of before half the people here were born, <laughs> maybe 20-odd 20, 20 years ago, um, it was for the word adult. And among the top collocates that was mentioned for adult was the word lugworm. Now, yeah, how do we respond to that as lexicographers? I mean, do we say, okay, I better record lugworm in my entry for adult because it's the software tells me it's a, a strong collocate? Uh, well, we don't do that, of course. We say, you know, hang on a minute. Uh, there's something funny going on here. So we go back to the source data and we find, oh, yes, I, I see there are, there are plenty of occurrences of this combination, but actually they're all in a single file. It's not a dispersed, something that's dispersed throughout the corpus. Uh, well, okay, at that point we were working with a very small corpus uh, by today's standards, BNC. We thought it was big at the time. And also the saliency scores that we were using to identify collocations were um, not as fine-tuned as the ones we use now. It was probably MI, actually. Um, but the basic point still holds that with the tools that we have now and the tools that are used in post-editing lexicography, we can always go back to the source. We can go back to the corpus data on which our semi-automatic tools are based. Uh, and this, to me, is the critical human part, even in highly automated uh, environments. And it's a really important, well, I think basic feature of the tools used in post-editing lexicography. And as far as I can see, you can't do this with chat GPT. It's kind of a black box. Uh, now, I, I don't know enough of, of the technology to know whether this is an inherent problem uh, with large language models. Uh, but if it is, then I think it's a deal breaker. I think these things are, are, are no good unless you can see, uh, well, this has been mentioned before, but you want to know w not what it's saying, but why it's saying it and, and what, it, what the evidence is for it. Thank you. My main point is that we need to distinguish between the engine uh, large language model and the chat interface. The engines are not new. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the engine that was used in some of the papers at this conference, uh, GPT 3.5, is uh, several years old. Uh, we should have known about it several years ago, but we didn't. Uh, before that, there were other models. Uh, again, several years before that, uh, and we didn't know about those either. And they did exactly the same, I mean, all those models have been doing the same content stuff that we are surprised at now. They have been doing it for years. It's only that we noticed it now. And the reason why we noticed it now is that it became available using a chat interface, which was accessible to the general public. You didn't have to install anything, you didn't have to uh, be technically able to, to run the model yourself, uh, you, you could access one on the web. Uh, th that's what made us, as part of the general public, aware of uh, those models. Uh, now, the capability of those models uh, has been surprising even for their own creators, uh, starting from the famous paper by Andrei Karpati, where he generated Shakespeare-style uh, poetry uh, and called it uh, unexpected or surprising, the, the result that he, he achieved. So that's one thing. But the other thing I think is more, I, yes, to, to, to finish the, the unexpected part, uh, I don't claim that I can predict what will happen next week, uh, let alone next year, because the developments so far have been surprising and uh, it's to be expected that uh, developments next week will also be surprising. Uh, and they might be very surprising. They, they might uh, be uh, world-changing. Uh, I can't exclude that possibility. But one thing that is already clear is uh, the development of user interface uh, styles in general. Uh, we are now accustomed to 2D uh, inter interfaces, like flat things, paper, computer screen, phone screen. Uh, this has been going on for a long time, if we also count paper. Uh, now there is uh, two, there are two 
opposing trends. One is towards 3D, all this augmented reality thing, wearing glasses and, and seeing stuff around you as, as if you were in a virtual world. And the, the other is 1D, uh, like sequential user interfaces. And some people claim that the sequential access is much more natural for humans than the 2D access. So it's much more natural to just ask somebody, what does this word mean? Rather than open a book or open a website and, and start uh, searching for, for a word and then start searching on the page, where do I find its meaning? I, I, it, it is claimed that it's much more natural to just ask or ask uh, when was this word first used or, or what are its equivalents in uh, whatever languages. Um, so what we need to take into account, I think, is first, uh, we don't know what will happen with the content capabilities of the engine uh, in the near future. And second, we need to be prepared that uh, the public will get used to uh, 1D or sequential user interfaces uh, and not be prepared or not be, not be willing anymore to look at uh, papers or screens. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have three statements uh, and I make it brief. So the first one is that uh, large language models, including Czech GPT, are really only language models. So they generate a probable continuation of, of the prom prompt. Yeah, so we can see it as someone who dictates uh, what uh, is a, a probable continuation. And I think that this dictating is uh, uh, um, quite good analogy because uh, it does not uh, go back. So it, it's not uh, that it writes something where, uh, where it can go back and rewrite it uh, to, to make it better. It just dictated word by word. Uh, uh, the second statement is that uh, uh, language models cannot be used now uh, to generate uh, even some part of uh, uh, dictionary entries. Uh, and that's uh, because uh, even very good lexicographers cannot dictate some dictionary entry without some thinking or uh, consulting some corpora and so on. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, it will never be the situation that uh, a language model will generate uh, uh, a dictionary entry from scratch, from, yeah, without some thinking. Uh, and the second statement is that uh, we can use uh, large language models uh, to do some uh, small task as we do now uh, for this, uh, say, post editing or, or annotating and so on. Uh, and especially uh, if the large language models uh, are trained or fine tuned for, for that task. And I think it. Uh, also in the same way as we can ask uh, native speakers without any uh, lexicography uh, training to do some of these tasks. We just have to ask the right questions. So we can make some, uh, mm, some prompt engineering on ChatGPT or we can train or fine tune some large language models. Yeah, so that's all. All right, so by pure pure sheer luck, I'm, I, I'm in a position where we came from, you know, we're going to be replaced to, you know, we're not going to be replaced. And my view is also very balanced between those two views. So first thing that I've been repeating since ChatGPT came out and I, I'm a developer primarily, uh, everybody's been saying we're going to be replaced. And I've been saying, you know, it's been trained to sound like a human, so when it's wrong, it's very confidently wrong. And I think we've seen that uh, in a lot of presentations. So th that's one of the reasons why we probably overestimate the model a little bit. Now, the part that scares me, and not only me, but you know, a lot of the 
public and not only the public but the experts is that we don't really understand some of the emerging behaviors. While it's true that the model only predicts the next word, we don't really know why it sometimes sounds like it's making logical decisions or why it's, you know, because it's not really designed to do that. So that's the part that no one really understands at the moment and that's the scary part of why we might be replaced at a certain point. Um, and one thing we haven't been talking about a lot is we're, we're talking about ChatGPT and you've mentioned the engine. Um, so one thing that's also now are the open source models. You might have heard about them, the Llama, the Alpaca, the Open Llama that's coming out now. So one thing that might be interesting in the future is also to see how we can train specific models that help us in the lexicographic jobs. And I think everything else has been said, so back to Sima. Okay, so this is now my microphone. I'll uh, use it and you can use the three. So uh, <clears throat> this is also not something that will surprise the panelists. I sent them some questions and this is what we'll discuss now. Uh, sorry, Michael. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'll give you a, a half a minute to, you know, take this in. But um, <clears throat> let me start like this. There are some things that uh, <clears throat> we can't do in any case, and even the whole Europe can't do versus USA, but there, are, there may be some things that we can do. And at the end of this uh, round table, my wish is to understand a little bit better what lexicographic community should actually do in the next two years, let's say, uh, until the next ELEX, that can uh, alleviate or help us better uh, <coughs> to understand and to do things that we have to do. So, uh, my question is, uh, first, do you think do you think that we should focus on things like prompt engineering, which was mentioned several times during uh, today and in, in the talks, uh, or maybe uh, <coughs> focus a little bit also on, um, on um, specialized lexicography, let's call it Lex GPT, which means that you take a model, maybe it's not the biggest one that, uh, is in the USA, but smaller ones which work still work pretty well. And uh, maybe in this way, um, <coughs> uh, in this way, enable um, so the, the complaints that we heard uh, now, like can we go back to the source? Uh, uh, we get different answers every time and so on. And this time I'll start uh, with you, Marco, because you said something about. Yeah, so I, I've I've already <laughs> I've already hinted at at my position at this topic. So I think that you know it's very important. Uh, so GP, Chat GPT has been trained primarily on English corpora, right? So yes, I think we should start focusing on creating the data sources to train adequate model, especially for under-resourced languages. I'm a Slovenian guy, so you know there are two million speakers. Uh, it's very very hard to to get good resources to even train small models, yet alone large language models. So I think this is this is one area where we should work on. Yeah. Uh, anyone else has a? Yes, Arvi, please. Um. Is it on? Yeah. Um, I think this is self-evident, and not only for us, but for our uh, language communities in general, that we need. Uh, the models to speak our languages and our languages in general, not not just our lexicography. Uh, but uh, regarding what we should do, I think um, we should really take into account the possibility that people will require answers to their questions about language rather than requiring a dictionary. So we, we should at least uh, in the long run have in mind the possibility that uh, we should not be using or concentrating on using uh, those uh, whatever technologies uh, as part of the lexicographic process, but uh, perhaps as part of providing 
the information to the users that the users need. Um, so not a lexicographer using the model, but a user using the model. Michael, do you have an answer to this or um, a comment on this? Yeah, I mean, as that's, a long that's the idea of sort of cutting out the middleman, isn't it? And um, we do we do a lot of this already, don't we? I mean, if you if you if you want a kind of quick fix uh, uh, to resolve some kind of lexical query, you very often don't use a dictionary. You 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 go to DeepL or you go to Google or something and just say, you know, what does that mean or what's the what's the Spanish word for this, um, and that. That generally works pretty well. So um, I guess the question is whether chat GPT, I mean, at the moment, I think would be a more cumbersome way of doing doing the same thing. But whether it could be um, trained to do uh, something, do it better, I don't know. As far as dictionaries go, I think, you know, we've, we've, we've looked at this in sort of binary terms. You know, do we, does chat GPT sort of replace all the stuff that we do now? And I would, I would, Sort of lower the expectations quite a lot and say, well, we can figure out what it does really well and what it doesn't do so well, and incorporate um, it, it into the the tools that we use uh, at the moment. That, mm. that would be how mm. I would do. So, in a way, think of it in a sort of slightly less ambitious way. <laughs> Gilles Maurice, you're ambitious, so <laughs> yes, yes. You know, I, we're missing the point. This is a general purpose tool. Jet. ChatGPT right now does everything for everyone. It passes exams on the weirdest topics, and we are just this tiny slice of the population, 0.0001% of them who, who work on dictionaries. And we're already impressed. Now, should we make a Lex GPT? Of course, because what is it now? They grabbed a few free, poor Merriam-Webster dictionaries, left, right, center, and that's what they used to, I'm sorry, regurgitate what we get. But imagine, we start putting in Macmillan, OLD, Cambridge, good dictionaries. Yeah, that's the source material. And it will copy, copy that. The only thing it's really good at right now is defining, even Cobalt style definitions. There's a paper forthcoming from Robert Leff on that. Super. It does a super job. As good as the definition that we find in the Cobalt dictionaries. Why? Because it's natural language. So that's what the tool was supposed to do. It, it does what everyone already does. So if we want something specialized, we make sure that there is enough data. Also in Slovenian and Zulu and Swahili and all the languages we would like to work on fed into the model, apply the same things, and we'll have a perfect tool. So I remain optimistic. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> let me put it like this then. If the answer is yes. Uh, <clears throat> I came from Brussels, where these discussions uh, were also in that kind of community, NLP community. And what already happened, for instance, is that um, the Swedes wanted to make, the, make their own GPT for Swedish. First thing, they, uh, what happened is that they found out they don't have enough data, no way. So uh, <clears throat> the second thing is that, okay, so can we look at the neighboring languages which are kind of, uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, similar? Okay, so what they got is the minimum number of data where you can produce GPT, which is 300 billion tokens. Uh, and four, uh, uh, 40 billion parameters. So this is how you get to a GPT uh, 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 similar language model for Nordic languages. Okay, so, uh, and this has been already done. Um, <clears throat> so we can, <sighs> Can we say that, and that's a question for Pavel, <laughs> because you have a lot of data, would you go into something like that, or not at all? It doesn't work. Huh? Uh, uh, I think that uh, for a lot of uh, tasks in uh, uh, the, uh, during the uh, dictionary building, uh, 
you don't need uh, so big uh, models. So you can uh, use uh, much larger uh, or much smaller data than uh, was used for ChatGPT. Uh, and I think that we have enough data for, for this. I think that you have, uh, you can train just on tens of billion of words and we have such data for many languages. Uh, and also you don't need uh, so large data models in a number of parameters. So uh, you can actually train uh, smaller models which are specialized to the task you, you want to do. Uh, and this could be done not on some supercomputers, but uh, on computers you can rent for a few hundred, maybe thousands of uh, dollars. And many of such com computers are on universities and uh, research centers and so on. So I think that, uh, uh, and also the, uh, the development of this uh, uh, language models technology is uh, approaching quite fast, especially in the uh, open source uh, area. Uh, and there are estimates that uh, it is much faster than uh, these commercial companies like Google and, and uh, OpenAI. Uh, so I think that uh, in uh, a few years uh, we can train such models uh, using uh, 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 much smaller resources uh, than uh, uh, now. So it will be, uh, I think, uh, well, easy to make such lax uh, model. Yes, I don't think we need to go into technical detail here, but just to just a reminder that there is also a thing called fine-tuning. Uh, we don't build, we don't need to build the models from scratch, but we can fine-tune uh, those foundation models. And uh, since I haven't read the news today and yesterday, I'm uh, completely behind. Uh, and and uh, uh, we, we don't know what's going on in, I mean, I don't know what's going on nowadays uh, in, in the space of creating specialized models. Yeah, so two excellent points. I just want to combine them. Basically, there are already models outside, like I mentioned, Llama, and they are quantized models that can already be fine-tuned with co consumer hardware, like an NVIDIA 4090. Uh, so this is already doable. But again, based on our experiments, for example, it's very hard for languages that have not been used in the original training. So fine-tuning is fine if the model has at least seen the language during its training phase. If not at all, then the results can be pretty random. And are you saying that our, I mean, Slovenian and Estonian, is is that what you call not at all? So yes, the Slovi for example, the original Lama from ETA has been trained on Slovenian Wikipedia, which is relatively small. Uh, also Estonian Wikipedia, but the Open Lama, which has a more permissive license, for example, has only seen English. So yeah, it, it's it's a bit of a challenge. Okay. Any other comment on this, uh, <clears throat> or we, we move to multilingual question? Like, uh, well, we touched it already just now. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, the existence of language in the digital world seems to depend on the fact if it has a Wikipedia or something that can be used. Uh, just. I mean, basically by U.S. companies. Um, so, <laughs> do, you, do you think that this divide between... So, what we know is that English is far, far away from everything else. Then there are three languages in Europe, uh, which are Spanish, German, and French. And there is the rest of us, and we are kind of, you know, at the long tail, let's say, the small ones. So what kind of consequences does this have? And the small ones, we know we'll have to think about alternative ways of getting data and languages into something that will be used. Uh, <clears throat> and maybe that's a question for you, Arvi, as you are responsible for your language in a way. 
Yes, thank you for addressing it to me. Uh, I, I think we need to get rid of uh, three things. Uh, copyright, personal data, and uh, confidential confidentiality. Uh, so, so, so that we can include everything in the corpora, uh, and uh, that, that will help our languages survive. Uh, we, we don't need what uh, some people say that uh, we need language cultivation in, in those small uh, languages, we, ne we need to prescribe what are the correct forms. No, that's not, uh, it, it doesn't help the language survive. What helps the language survive is getting as much text as possible available to the large commercial uh, companies. Okay. Uh, Marco, did you want to comment? Yeah, just don't forget the alphabet challenge as well, because you know, the English and the Germanic languages have a very similar alphabet, and when you come to this part of Europe, you suddenly have a lot of different characters making an appearance, which again, you know, increases the complexity of training the models. Uh -huh. So, <coughs> Cyrillic, a large family, but maybe Greeks are more endangered than, okay. Uh, yes, Gilles Maurice? Yes, from a really endangered continent even. Uh, talking for Bantu languages in Africa. Okay, so we have a problem. We are talking millions and not billions and hundreds of billions of words. But look at what is the output of ChatGPT. There are no copyright issues. You can't see who wrote what because it's a machine. There is no privacy. There is no one involved. It's a black box. So all you need to do, build those billions of corpora. So all you need to do is let everyone speak at home, put recorders there, let it transcribe automatically, and you have your billions of words for Zulu and Swahili and, and all the other languages. Okay, so <clears throat> that's a challenge maybe for Michael. What <clears throat> if you think about you need a corpus, you just order it from, well, a model in a way that uh, you would define genres you would define, um, I don't know, topics, you would define the way, uh, how long are the sentences, uh, what is the distribution of, um, you know, the length of sentences, how many words should be used there, everything, you can do everything. You order a corpus and then you use it for lexicographic description. Is just a blasphemy or? I don't know why that would be better than what we have already. Because it would, it would mean that a language, okay, uh, so <laughs> maybe I can even say uh, a, a, a more terrible assumption. Let's say that uh, you order a new book by St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, okay. I mean, this is where we are going. Yeah. Indeed, kind of going. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would just like the system to be a lot more discriminating. Um, I, I was talking to Robert after my talk. I, I was saying that um, in my talk, or in the talk I did with Milos, that it had, it had made up meanings. And one of the meanings I claimed that it had made up apparently does exist in Urban Dictionary. Uh, but then I looked at the entry in Urban Dictionary, all the entries, and, and there are dozens. This is for the word, what was the word? Cookie. There are dozens of different so-called meanings. I mean, most of them kind of borderline pornographic, and it just seemed like the system had kind of gone in to uh, scrape stuff off Urban Dictionary, and it's utterly undiscriminating. <laughs> and, and then it presents it as, as a so-called meaning. Uh, you know, you ask for a definition of cookie, and it comes up with all this stuff. And there's something deeply wrong with this. Um, and, and, you know, in comparison with all the systems we have now, even quite automated ones, and, and that worries me quite a lot. Yeah. Gilles Maurice? Do you have a comment on this? Like, you know, you have a really, really under-resourced language. And you can, from uh, the data that you get across languages, you actually can produce a lot of data which is semi-okay for a language that is completely under-resourced. What would be your um, <laughs> opinion on that? So it's a so I can good thing or a bad uh, thing? No, I can confirm. Uh, we did some tests, and uh, the output for very basic words in uh, some of the African languages is okay. But once you want to do something just more beyond primary one, it starts to struggle. 
and very very quickly it starts mixing languages even. And that is because, as Milos explained, it actually goes via English and then remaps it to the other languages. So it comes back to adding more data, for example, in the way I suggested. Okay. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> the question here uh, is, I know that you already said, I think every one of you, what do you think can be expected in the near future? Which technologies will prevail? To what extent is it possible to predict what will happen next? You know, the answer is we don't know, but just try. <laughs> <laughs> just try. Starting with you, Marco. Yes, very fortunate to be the first one. Uh, so yes, um, <laughs> as was said, it's very, very hard to predict. Things are moving really, really fast at this time. Um, but I think it's we are also at the top of the hype train, or, you know, hype, hype cycle at the moment. So as with the metaverse, what's going to happen now is we're going to distill what it's actually used for, what isn't. And I, I think we're going to see a lot of specialized models also appearing because of what, what was said here previously. Uh, I think that uh, there will be m uh, in uh, one year or more uh, or two years, there will be much more models we can play with. Uh, and maybe not for Bantu languages, but for most European languages, I think that there will be some large language models we can try to use and fine tune and play with. I can confidently predict one thing. Uh, there are, but there will be things that will happen in the near future, which will be significant and which we can't predict now. <laughs> I mean, it's such a rapidly moving target, isn't it? And, and I mean, we're all talking about this now and people have been experimenting with things. It only came out in November or something last year. So, yeah, God, and, and such vast amounts of money are being thrown at this. That, yeah, I can't believe you predict that things are going to happen that, that, uh, that we can't predict. So, yeah. No, it's, it's very, very easy to predict. There will be three types of dictionaries. One, those produced fully automatically. And I know, because our software is used for it, that these already exist, they're being sold, and no one knows that the machine made them. Two, you have the, the more or the less scrupulous publishers who will say, well, we, we got help from ChatGPT, the prompter ChatGPT, and um, we modified it, like we do now in post-editing uh, lexicography. And then the third one will be, that was my the last paragraph of the opening statement, where people will say, you know, this is done manually. We did not use computers. <laughs> no corpora. I sat down with my team, and for 20 years, we wrote this by hand. So this is human. And this will then also sell because it is human and not a machine anymore. These will be the three dictionaries, the types of the future. A luxury item, then. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> well, maybe one thing has to be mentioned. One thing is predictable, and this is the last line I put here, that uh, European Commission looked across the Atlantic and were kind of afraid what's happening there. So there is now quite a lot of investment uh, which will go through European Commission into producing an open large language model, which will include definitely all European official or regional whatever languages. We don't know how much Chinese and Korean and Japanese and so on, but definitely European languages. So we'll be able to play with that, I think, in a year's time. No, two years' time, two years' time. Next ELEX. It will be available, I think. And now I would like to actually give the floor to you because I'm sure you are now thinking things. And um, do you have any questions for the panelists? Or is it just so? 
Milos, I guess you you usually want to comment. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the very first thing that I was just thinking about after you mentioned the EU support, <clears throat> sorry, uh, it perfectly illustrates the difference between the US and the EU. After Facebook released the Open Llama model, it started being investigated by the US Senate. So there is now a committee in the US Senate and Zuckerberg has troubles again, and it might even end up by you know them having to close, whatever. So what the U.S. is doing, the U.S. is you know just checking that things are all right, having all the companies doing all the hard work. What the EU is doing, trying to throw money all over the space, desperately looking for someone who would you know um, chase the U.S. And it's not going to happen. Do you have any question for uh, the panelists, or they simply answered all your questions that you might have? <laughs> okay. Anyone else? I was wondering, you seem to be insinuating, perhaps especially you, Arvi, that that um, that dictionaries um, will not be used anymore because it's moving to, to speech or similar things, 1D, as you called it. Um, so if dictionaries are not going to be used, are we going to be producing dictionaries for anybody, or are we going to be producing dictionaries for ChatGPT, for instance, or similar tools? And if we do that, would they look completely different? I mean, is a is a point of distilling this graphic information for the use of AIs, or should we just feed them raw data? What do you think? That was for Arvi. Yeah. Well, Michael. Microphones are piling up. <laughs> I would still separate the content and the user interface. Um, the content I can't predict, but uh, we should be pre be prepared that the public will shift their preference of the user user interface. So we might uh, find ourselves uh, preparing content for a chat uh, style interface. Uh, whatever is the division of labor between human and machine there. But it, it could be that uh, the products that we have now, just as we uh, even during this conference series have moved from uh, paper to e-dictionaries, uh, we might move from e-dictionaries to chat dictionaries. Uh, and, and that's a challenge. Uh, we we uh, need to rethink everything that we know about uh, user preferences, uh, we might need to uh, compile or, or publish uh, things in parallel for a period, uh, just as, as we did with paper and E, uh, with paper and CD and then paper and web. Uh, and uh, we might uh, find ourselves uh, creating chat interfaces to our existing lexical resources. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I will just follow up on, on what you just said because I think this is really important and that we can, I think we get a lot of insights into the future actually from going back to users and to scenarios of, of dictionary use. And we know how dictionaries for, for which problems they were used, right? For productive problems, some types uh, of searches from receptive, for translation, for education, etc. And I don't think that people will be using dictionaries for these questions anymore. I also don't think they will be using any sort of chatbots. I think they will be using tools and everything will be integrated naturally in those tools. So I was thinking if you have maybe any, any ideas about how we as lexicographers can contribute to the creation of those tools and maybe be at least slightly competitive with the big guys like you know, Google is announcing stuff every week and it will be amazing and I, I can hardly wait. But maybe there is some something that we also at the national level have to do, you know, to control our data in, in, in relation to those um, corporations and, and create these tools, help create them to keep this um, to ourselves in a way. Do you want to just make a sure, yeah. comment yeah. sort of following up? What you're saying is uh, last week in Asia, like Yuko Tono, who you know always done a lot of work on dictionary use and research, and he was saying that Japanese 
younger students now no longer have the kind of image of what a dictionary is, which I thought was a very interesting observation because, um, because yeah, they're, they're not actually, well, they're certainly not looking at a book, but they're not even saying, well, this, I'm looking at a dictionary. They're just investigating the behavior of some word or phrase or something that they're interested in or puzzled by. So that they've already lost the sense that, you know, th this is a dictionary. But I don't think that, I don't think that's a cause for dismay because, you know, they are still looking at ultimately lexicographic data. Uh, it's just that it's, you know, as you say, it, it, it appears in some in, in a different form. Okay, thanks. Oh, yeah, a lot of. <laughs> thanks. Okay, yeah. Um, I would like to ask you on your opinion on capitalism. So if I rephrase. <laughs> So let's say, I mean, we have le le lexicographers, right? And you have, I don't know, eight hours a day to perform some work. And a, a big part can be done, let's say, by chat GPT, if not today, maybe in a few days. <laughs> but I mean, there are still a lot of steps. I mean, there are biases in language models. Maybe there are words which are not in the models that were trained, right, in the data. So there are, I mean, all these recent descriptions of languages, I mean, of the language that is covered and of course there are many languages that are not covered so i mean isn't it all about like i mean either you fire all the lexicographers or maybe you just think which are the interesting tasks and they can have a lot of copies while doing this in peace and we have very high quality resources i mean i saw a very nice meme <laughs> that answers this uh, very nicely, actually. You know, it's like when the calculator was invented, it did not remove the mathematicians. So I, I look at it in a very similar way, just like you're describing. And, and not only the calcul calculator, but also Wolfram Alpha, uh, which does much more complicated stuff. Uh, but uh, I, I also have an experience with people not knowing what the dictionary is. I went to a school and uh, as as a routine question to wake the audience up, uh, I asked them to raise their hands who, who is using a dictionary. No hands. Who has ever used a dictionary? Still no hands. Are you sure? <laughs> then two teachers raised their hands. Uh, but uh, w what can we do? I, I, I think, uh, or, or should we fire lexicographers? Uh, I, I think it's, it's part of the same question. Uh, w what we need to do is, uh, create truthful content, content that really reflects uh, what the language is like, not necessarily what we would like it to be like. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you previously said that it's deeply wrong, uh, that, that this pornographic uh, meaning is, is in, in the dictionary. Well, th this is our opinion. No. It, 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 it doesn't change the fact that there is such a meaning. And, and we, sh we, sh we should be able to uh, describe language adequately uh, so, so that the quality of it will be such that people will want to use our uh, product. No, no, I mean, I, I certainly wasn't um, implying some uh, <laughs> prescriptive uh, <laughs> tendencies. No, my, my point about the Urban Dictionary is that it, it, it's just people chuck things into it pretty much at random, and, and uh, some of it's very good, but I, I found it kind of rather hard to believe that there were these sort of 15 min meanings to cookie, and, and I kind of sense that quite a lot of them were just one person's <laughs> opinion who, who wanted to get in there. So yeah, I mean, of course, high quality content, which is sort of what we aim to do at the moment on the basis of you know, uh, spending a lot of time analyzing language as it is used on a large scale. Oh, I, just to actually one one more point about that that business of what's a dictionary. There was an advert on the TV a while ago where I can't even remember what it was for, but there's a mother talking to her, you know, quite young child who's six or seven who's sort of stuck looking at a tablet, and she says to him, um, "Oh, you're still on your computer," and and he says, "What's a computer?" <laughs> and don't you think same thing? So great panel. I noticed that we had the point made that we need to, <laughs> these LLMs need to be more discriminating, that we need to provide them lots more great content. And, you know, by the way, English, there are many Englishes and not all of them are well represented. Um, my question is, 
But what's the importance of building an LLM that can hedge, that can say, I don't really know? Anyone? <laughs> there was si oh, yeah. Um, I guess uh, one one thing is missing in this discussion that uh, um, most uh, uh, dictionary users, electronic dictionary users, or and creators of dictionary, they still think that uh, people. Uh, want and and gonna uh, use this dictionary using the search window and this is so 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 middle ages yeah uh, say chat gpt doesn't discriminate between uh, different spelling variants also spelling errors we had special session when we worked with uh, sketch engine and it was uh, taught to us how to uh, write uh, the right way Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi can be with space, with, with di hyphen, and as one word. And there is special, special way how to write it in Sketch Engine. But it's, uh, again, it's a Middle Ages. Uh, people are looking for real, real answers, and that's what they're getting from systems like ChatGPT. They uh, asking for meaning. They asking for similar words. They asking for examples, for usage examples. If they don't know what uh, some medication is for, they can ask, and they will get a very detailed answer about it, and so on and so on. But uh, regarding uh, if we uh, concentrate on lexical uh, GPT, some product, okay. Uh, but uh, we need to build it, uh, keeping in mind that uh, uh, this user interface should be much more contemporary. So uh, uh, chat should be fused with search. It it's, uh, should be in, uh, done already, I don't know, 10 years ago. Yeah. Yes, if I may. I don't think uh, we have to go back to the Stone Age. So we used to say we look up in a dictionary. About a decade ago, the, the data in my corpus shows that we started searching. Okay, We don't look up anymore, we search. Now we mentioned Yuki Otono, Japan indeed. In February I noticed, okay, this is my highest technology equipment, but all my children have a smartphone. They just talk and point. They have to go to the toilet, they point to see which button does what, because you know in Japan they have fancy toilets, they heat their water there, and if you have the wrong button, okay, things go wrong. <laughs> but, so continuously in the streets, I would have used a dictionary in the past, you know, I'm that dinosaur, but they just have these, not computers, something, a screen, and the screen solves all issues. They talk to the screen, and they use the screen to see what's going on in the world. And th so, to reply, what's our task? we must make sure that what's behind the black boxes, apart from LLMs, also the lexical stuff that is fed to these black boxes is of the highest quality. That's, if we want the future, that's where we can contribute. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, Gilles Maurice, I'm <clears throat> sorry to say that you had the last word. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I have to finish now. <laughs> I know you will be glad. Uh, it's four or five minutes past seven. We have a dinner, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussion like this in the next years. I would like to thank the panelists, really, for a lively debate, let's say. And uh, we are finishing the roundtable now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.